Um, can I introduce, um, I'm delighted to introduce um, Alex Freeman. Alex graduated two years ago. Yes. Just over One two and years half. ago with a first class honours degree in mechanical engineering. Uh, for his sins, he decided to choose me as his final year supervisor and his third year group design uh, in the EIP project in the second semester. Uh, in third year, he worked at GKN <coughs> rather than doing a group design project and then doing his final year project. He then uh, has moved on, um, carrying on work on additive manufacturing in metal. Um, and he'll tell you a bit about his project related to or his formula student. Uh, but he's now working at Renishaw, um, and he's been working there for about a year. Be, about a year. Yeah, a year and a bit. A year and a bit. So he graduated in 2014. 2014. So he, he did only a year and a bit. It feels like two years. I know. So Alex is going to talk about metal additive manufacturing or a metallic additive manufacturing method. Um, I'll hand over to Alex. I'm delighted you're here. Thanks, Alex. Thank you, Steve. You can't hear me? The microphones are all working? Hi, right, guys. Yeah, great. Okay. So, yeah, we're going to talk about metallic additive manufacturing today because the term additive manufacturing, 3D printing, it all gets bandied around, but really there's quite a few distinct categories in the most 3D printing applications. Uh, they're more like toys, prototypes, as opposed to anything of any engineering use for us, which is, of course, what we're interested in. So, today I'm going to go over a few things, but really just going to try and give you an overview of the main categories of additive manufacturing. And we'll take some questions at the end. So, a bit about me. A fairly underwhelming list of quite boring and generic characteristics. The important thing, of course, is I graduated with the world's best engineering degree, which in a few years' time you guys will probably get the pleasure of that as well. I also was part of the Team Bath racing team. I very recommend getting involved with that. It's a really good opportunity to put to uh, use your design and manufacturing skills to build a real product because it's not often you really get an opportunity to do that through your degree is actually design build right from the very beginning right to the very end and you get to test and race it so it's an absolutely fantastic opportunity and employers really really value that sort of thing i did some uh, aerospace design analysis you'll probably notice a theme of a lot of aerospace case studies running through this it's just because it's what i know really with my limited engineering experience. <laughs> and now I work at Renishaw, of course. Renishaw, another good company. I should state that I'm not here representing Renishaw. I'm here as an independent. But um, yeah, they're a great company. I've had a really good time there. And at the moment, I'm working back in metallic additive manufacturing, which is my, my passion, of course. And of course, I'm an AM nerd which is absolutely the most important thing of all on that list. So Renishaw, you can see here, oh, blimey, I'm stood in the wrong place here. We have Sir David McMurtry here. He's our glorious leader, an inventor by trade, and he started the company about 40 odd years ago. And uh, you see this gadget here? Does anyone know what this is, by the way? Massive props if you do. It's quite a niche gadget. It's called a touch trigger probe. And this one is actually a, a clever new breed which scans a surface. So it will, go, it will go onto a surface and does this sort of thing and takes a finite number of points across the surface and will give you a complete map of that surface. And of course then you can use that to measure whether your part or whatever you're measuring is within tolerance which is extremely important to high-performance applications such as aerospace, such as automotive, where you need to make sure that what you're making is to spec. So that kind of started off the metrology revolution, and Renishaw has been a world leader in that ever since. Uh, they invest very heavily in research, which is really uncommon in the UK. I think in America you have to invest quite a high percentage of your profit 
back into research by law, whereas there is no such obligation in the EU. So the fact that Renishaw do invest so heavily in their research capability is, is quite unique, really, in the UK. So that's a real big plus. Unfortunately, I'm working back in research, so I get to play around with all this money, which is really, really fun. And not many companies will tell you you need to spend more. They tell you you need to spend less. So that's great. They're taking loads of graduates, loads from, loads from Bath, absolutely loads. And here's our core capability. Metrology, like I said here, which is the science of measurement, basically. Uh, precision encoders, medical dental. You may have seen this. This is pretty clever. It's um, effectively a brain surgery robot, and it injects probes into the center of the brain, and it hits a, uh, a gland, which is about the size of a pea, right in the center of the skull. And typically, surgeons would just have to have a hell of a lot of experience, and unfortunately, trial and error with poor patients, whereas the robot, obviously, you can program to have the experience of the surgeon. So you now don't need a surgeon with 40 years' experience to do these life-saving surgeries. Uh, one such is Parkinson's, where it hits this gland with precision in the middle of the brain. And of course, if you miss it or if you hit an artery on the way through, then the patients are gone. So this uh, robot allows you to repeatably and <coughs> safely perform this surgery. And the results can be remarkable. You can get some, I've seen a video where a patient has been virtually unable to stand due to the severity of their Parkinson's, and after the surgery, a couple of days later, they get up and walk across the room. It's incredible. And you might be familiar with this. That's um, an additive manufacturing build plate with uh, what is the Renishaw bike. So that is an entire bike frame in one build, and then they glue it all together with uh, an aerospace grade adhesive. Which you might think sounds quite suspect, but a lot of adhesives these days are actually stronger than welds for a lot of things if you use them in the right way. Glues are extremely powerful in tension, and, uh, or very good in shearing, I should say, and very poor in any peeling application. So you can see there you've got uh, a nice shear plane developing when the bike slots together. So it works really well, and I think they save quite a bit of weight using additive manufacturing for, for the bike frame. So, next, uh, just a brief overview of where additive manufacturing sits in you know, manufacturing processes as, as a whole, because you'll probably hear a lot of sensationalist claims by the media, additive manufacturing is going to fix everything, everything we make in the future is going to be additive manufactured, and really... It's a complete load of nonsense. Additive manufacturing is an excellent solution for some things and really, really poor at others. For volume manufacturing, just, just forget it. For anything small, high running, it's just there's nothing available right now or on the horizon which could possibly compete with uh, forming processes. But when it gets into the very high end, the complexity of design that you can achieve with powder bed processes means that for very low volume, very high performing applications, it's a fantastic tool to enable designers. So yeah, like I said at the beginning, with additive manufacturing, it's a very broad term still, really, and it's not very focused. So you really have two competing well, actually, I should, should not say competing at all because they're very uncompetitive processes complementing different areas of uh, the manufacturing market. You have powder bed fusion, which can make the very small, intricate parts, which you're probably familiar with seeing, which is probably put all over the, all over the media, the type of very intricate, highly optimised structures which you couldn't build using any other process. And that's what's really advertised and it is, um, yeah, it's publicized a lot. But the other side of the coin is the direct energy deposition methods, which works very similarly to, say, how 
a uh, inkjet printer would. In effect, it's just depositing material. However, with an inkjet printer, it's just a 2D in a one pass. With a 3D printing process, obviously, you get repeat layers. And um, generally, it's done with either wires or powders. But uh, these are very good for making very, very massive structures, because, of course, you're not really limited in the size of um, the part you build. Because with, these, with the powder bed fusion processes, they have to be built in a controlled environment, whether that is an inert gas, which prevents oxidation of the material, titanium being one which is extremely reactive to oxygen, and titanium oxide is a useless engineering material for, um, for structural purposes anyway. <laughs> However, with direct energy deposition, you don't have this requirement. You can build however big your machine is. There really is no restriction. But the payoff with that is the resolution that you can achieve with direct energy deposition is pretty poor, and you could never achieve something as intricate as a highly optimized structure that you could achieve with a powder bed um, solution. But we'll get to the finer points in a minute. I should mention these are all commercialized processes. This is stuff that you could go out and buy a machine if you had a lot of money. And there's so much other additive manufacturing and research being done all the time, and you probably, you've probably called me out already, like, oh, I know one. I know one that's not on there. I could make a very, very big figure, and it would take me very long to compile it, and I'm not sure it'd be particularly helpful. So these are the ones that you can get right now off the shelf. Okay, so a little bit more on the on the technical aspects of, of why you would choose any particular additive manufacturing process for what you're designing. You can see on the left that the powder bed fusion process it takes a very long time. Rapid manufacturing, you hear some people say. Well, it's not entirely true. For prototyping, this is it's a very quick way of doing things because you don't have to design for your manufacturing method, you can just design. So through the whole prototyping process, using additive manufacturing, or powder bed fusion in this case, is quicker. If you're producing hundreds of thousands of these parts, you can see from the screen, it's definitely not the quickest way of doing things. Billet CNC machining is very, very widely used is probably the most prominent manufacturing process for producing <coughs> high performance structures at the moment. You can achieve extremely good dimensional tolerances and extremely good surface finish. However, you are of course restricted by design for manufacture. You have to design for your manufacturing process. And this is uh, the direct energy deposition processes that I was talking about before. You see the powder one and the wire one. Now this is where direct energy deposition really, really shines. Yes, you can't achieve very good feature resolution. It's very challenging to optimize your structure. But when it comes to time, it's a very, very quick method of doing things because you're only depositing the material you need. And of course, when you're dealing with very, very high cost materials, the minimum amount of material deposited generally works out as the cheapest possible cost. And of course, time is money. No truer statement than in manufacturing, time is money. Half the time, more or less half the cost. So that's where wire deposition really comes into its own. Powder, you can see here, is slower, still a bit quicker than CNC machining but not quite as good as wires. So here I'm going to go into an overview of powder bed fusion processes. And we've got a video here of electron beam melting, which is hopefully going to work for us. And of course, it's an aeroplane. That's what I like. The 
turbine blade is almost the gold standard of powder bed fusion case studies. You see it time and time again. So you have a CAD model, gets broken down into layers by a, by a software program, a pre-processing software program. That's powder, of course, being poured into those hoppers. Okay. What happened now is all of the environment is being sucked out of that chamber, so you actually have a, almost a pure vacuum. The powder gets spread over, and it's a, the electron beam melts only the material that's required. And then the powder around the part, the fully dense part, supports that structure, so you don't get any warping. And of course, layer by layer, you develop your part. And with electron beam melting, it differs very, very slightly from selective laser melting in that the bed is heated to just below the melt temperature of the material. And that means that the electron beam doesn't actually ha have to add much more energy to the process to get the layer to melt. However, with selective laser melting, they don't have that. So let's play that again. <coughs> Another added benefit of this is it stops thermal distortion of the part. When you're adding layers and layers and layers, you've got extremely high heat to melt titanium. It's around 1,500 degrees, I think, from memory. And of course, at the bottom of your build, you've got much, much lower than that. You know, less than 100 degrees probably by the time you get from the top to the bottom of the build if you didn't heat your chamber. And this Obviously, a very hot material is very expansive, and as it cools, it contracts, and it builds up, builds up, builds up in an additive effect of this contraction, and you get a, quite a lot of warping on additive parts. This is a feature for all metallic additive manufactured parts. Plastics, too, actually, it should be said. You get this a lot on plastic deposition, which is quite limiting in a lot of ways. You can see in between... See the, the electron beam scans, the red scans over the whole bed? That's heating. And this is how electron beam melting gets around that, because it keeps quite a constant temperature for the whole chamber by keeping it hot, just below the melt temperature of the material. And so it actually gets around a lot of the uh, problems with thermally induced stress, which it is a big problem. It is a big problem. So as the part comes out, it's in what's called a cake. Because the powder's been heated to just below the melt temperature of the material, all the powder particles fuse together ever so slightly. And so it comes out as a solid block, and then you have to spray it all off, obviously. So that's electron beam melting. But effectively, selective laser melting, electron beam melting, you know, at the top level, the process is very, very similar. You're just substituting your electron beam for your laser beam. <coughs> okay, and here it is, selective laser melting. As you can see, you've got your laser beam. Laser beam is actuated on a mirror, though. So the mirror hinges around and directs the beam. Electron beam uses electromagnets to guide the electrons. But effectively, you're just melting layers on a powder bed, really, if you really want to get it down to the, the nuts and bolts of it. So the benefits of using powder bed fusion, really, the main benefit to using this process is it enables the designers to instead have to think constantly about design for manufacture. They're just designing for function. There's no, no restriction anymore. Whereas before, you're a designer, you're working in a company, you do your design, but can, can you even make it? You have to go to your manufacturing department, show them the drawings, they go, ooh, don't know about that feature, we can't achieve that tolerance, blah, 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 fire it back. You're going back and forth. It's a very laborious process, and it slows things right down. Design for function, however, it's 
not really an issue anymore. There are a few you know, subtleties that you've got to think about. Can you get the powder out of a hollow section that you've designed? You've, you know, you've got some internal structure. How are you going to get the powder out? That's, that's an issue. But really, you know, any engineer that's familiar with the process roughly can kind of see it for themselves. Another thing is, because you're only using the material that you need, you can use a better material. Your material costs have come right down. To build, you know, say, something like this, out of a solid block of material, and then you're machining away, I'd say 80% of that, for sure. You're just chucking 80% of your material in the bin. Titanium, I'll keep coming back to titanium because it is the classic additive manufacturing material. It's extremely expensive to machine. It's a very, very hard metal. It's very expensive metal. And the swarf is worth nothing. Because it oxidizes so strongly, you're blasting it off. It's very hot. It reacts incredibly strongly with oxygen. And your swarf is pretty much titanium oxide, which is completely useless. So your material costs are extremely high. Whereas with additive manufacturing, you're just building what you need. So instead of binning 80% of your material, you're just using the 20%. It's a lot cheaper. Instead of having to design an aluminium because titanium is too, too bloody expensive to use, well, actually, oh, well, we can just use titanium now because there's not really a lot of cost difference. You know, a few grams of titanium, a few grams of aluminium, it's neither here nor there. Whereas a few kilos of titanium versus a couple of kilos of aluminium, it's a big difference in that. The reduction of subassemblies is a big one. This case study here, this is put off... Uh, it's GE, and that's a fuel injector nozzle in a jet engine. And that was originally, I think, about 18 parts. And they've managed to reduce that down to about five. I think they've got about five components in that. Every time you're assembling something, you've got to bolt it together, you've got to glue it together. Not only is that assembly time that you've got to invest in the part, that it's also adds a lot of weight to your parts. Your fixturing is one of the biggest problems in aerospace design because you've got to bolt stuff together. If you can reduce your number of fixtures, it's just a win-win. Non-line of sight structures. Time and time again you see that. And a shameless plug is my final year project, which went on the Formula Student Car. In fact, we'll get it up on the uh, visualizer slide. It's a bit more fun. This is something similar to what they used before. When I say line of sight, it literally means line of sight. You've got your machining head, which has to go down, do the pockets, because that's the line that you can see, that's the line that you can machine. Additive manufacturing, you don't have that problem. Could you machine this? I highly doubt it. So this is effectively what you mean by non-line of sight structures. Lattices also come under that banner. I'm sure you've seen these very fine meshes that people are using. Very good for impact attenuation in, uh, in jet engine casings. Nose cones on on uh, Formula One cars. Manifolds. You see a lot of manifolds. In fact, that probably comes under something, a similar category. It's very, very challenging to make tubes, unless you weld it together, which is another assembly process, another weak point in your weld, whereas you can just build the whole thing in one piece. You don't have to assemble it. You don't have the weak points. So manifolds are a massive application in powder bed fusion processes. And conformal cooling, this is almost a new science. When you're making an injection molding die and tool, how do you cool it? If you're trying to punch out hundreds an hour, 
you've, most of your time is spent waiting for the thing to cool down. It slows things down immensely. Whereas now, you can make stuff like this. I think this particular case study, they said that their entire process, they, they can increase their output by 20% just by having clever cooling. And it's, yeah, it's a, it's a real, um, it can save companies a hell of a lot of money. And of course, unconstrained topology optimization. Has anyone heard of topology optimization? Show of hands? Wow, well go home and look it up, is all I can say. Really, really, it'll blow your mind. It blew my mind, I was sold. I saw it when I was on placement at uh, GKN Aerospace, and it's absolutely phenomenal. And I'll, I'll show you a little example of topology optimization in a minute. It's a complete opposite methodology of designing. Before you design something and you think, you use your engineering logic and go, oh, well, it probably need a member in that direction because there's a force going there and there's a force going there. So I'll put my members there and there. Then you put it to stress. You put it through a, a finite element analysis solver. And you see if it's strong enough. And then the results, you feed back into your design and you go through this iteration again and again and again. And really, you're optimizing, but you're never going to get to optimal. Of course, optimal doesn't exist. We all know that. But you're never going to get even close, really, unless you're a phenomenal designer, of course, which I'm not. So topology optimization is perfect for me. Topology optimization is the complete opposite way of doing things. Instead of designing something in CAD, you, design, you put your design space into your stress analysis software. You set up your load conditions, your constraints, you tell it the material, and you tell it the workspace in which it can work. You basically input a brick of material and load it up. You press go on the solver, and it iterates, 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 removing redundant material until you're left with this extremely organic, interesting, and I think quite sexy kind of structure. Is it bad admitting that? I think it probably is, to be fair. It's a bit worrying. I did say I'm a nerd, and I'm not ashamed, all right? OK, so here's the example. You can see, effectively, you feed a brick into the software. That's what you do. I should have mentioned this is what is called an upright. The bearing sits here. Of course, that's a bearing. <laughs> the hub goes in there, your wheel center and your wheel is rotating there. The brake caliper attaches to here and here. And your wishbone suspension struts are coming to the chassis of the car, there and there. I'm sure you can work that out from the, from the image on screen. So this is how the solver solves. <laughs> of course. Steve, we checked this earlier, didn't we? What's going on? Hmm. Do you have Dropbox on this computer? Because I've bigged it up now. I've got to show them. Is this your Dropbox? I have to go by the web. I didn't know you'd um, got a video there. Can we run over a couple of minutes? It's, oh. it's looking like that at the moment. I've got till five past, really, haven't I? Carry on talking. We've got till five past? No, I'll let him have a little, a little hiatus. That is just so annoying, isn't it? Why isn't that working? I, st I did stick it on Dropbox yesterday, though. Let's log in. You can log in. It's on your Dropbox as well. Should have dropped, got the whole folder and stuck it on there. That would have worked. Oh, well. Hindsight's great, isn't it? Where do you want to be? Top up video. 
not top up to video. There you go. Right, everyone, we've got it. At long last. Is it going to work? Aha, here we go. Great. So, that's fine. You can see it, right, guys? Yeah? Yeah, you can see that. It's quite short. This solved in, I think, 30 iterations. But for really complex models, it, you know, it can take hundreds, really. Obviously, it's dependent on how many load cases you've got going through the solver. You can see we start off with a brick of material. And each iteration is going removing redundant material, removing redundant material, until it moves towards the optimized solution. And you think, you know, the way I really like to think about this, and I don't really see many people using this analogy, but really, what other scientific phenomenon can you think about? Not necessarily physics. Evolution. Evolution. Thank you very much. Well done. No one sees it. No one sees it. I've never seen this analogy being used. But evolution, evolution iterates to find the optimal solution, to adapt to its environment. Topology optimization is evolution captured in software for engineers. It's extremely, extremely powerful and will completely revolutionize the way we do things in the future. Powder bed fusion, topology optimization. They're a match made in heaven. As you see, powder bed fusion machines come to full maturity and being adopted in industry, you will see a massive rise, a proportionate rise in topology optimization. Like I said, extremely powerful. Go home and look it up. In fact, for the proper geeks, you can get a student <coughs> license from a company called Altair. Make a note of that if you're interested. Altair. Altair Hyperworks. They'll give you a free license. This software is so expensive. Really use that. And really make your CV stand out from the crowd. I can topology optimize. That is a real big, that's a big tick in the box right there. Especially if you're interested in aerospace or automotive, this is going to be... Formula One teams have been doing this for years. Aerospace have been doing it for years, but they're not going to put it on a plane for a hell of a lot more years to come. Okay, enough about my design passions. Let's talk about manufacturing. So, of course, all these things are great, but we're still very limited. Limitations aren't nearly as interesting as the benefits, so I'll try and skim through this fairly quickly. Powder removal. You can't remove powder from internal structures very easily, especially if it's caked, if, it's, if the powder's sintered together. You're making a, a manifold with lots of intricate pipes. Well, how the bloody hell are you going to get the powder out of that? You're going to have to come up with a very novel way to blast the powder out. Reliability of the machines. This will improve as time goes on, of course. But at the moment, some machines are just research toys. They're not ready to run 24 hours a day, which is unfortunate. But they'll get there, so that's not a big one. Part size. You can't make a ginormous vacuum chamber. The biggest one I've seen made is half meter cubed. And that's really on the limit. It takes days to heat the bed up, and it takes days for the bed to cool down. Can you really be waiting a week just in heating and cooling the bed, no productivity time. You know, to build a full build could take you a week, at least. Two, two weeks to build a part. I mean, that's it's not good enough, really. So there is a limited size with powder bed fusion. Oh, well. Oh, no. We'll, we'll go over the other ones, actually. Why not? Surface finish. Yeah, this is a big one. Are we on the other one? Is it going to go? Mm -hmm. Is it going to focus for us? Look at that surface finish. That is suspect at best. It really is. You can see cracks. You can see the lines running it from the build, can't you? Cracks can initiate in those grooves. And that is a, that's a big problem. I don't know if have you covered fatigue. Yeah, covered a bit of fatigue. 
fatigue is the main reason aerospace won't put this stuff on planes. It's because you've got cycles of stress, bang, 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 and it opens up cracks in the surface over time, and then bang, your part will snap, which you don't want to be on that plane when that happens. So we covered this a little bit at the beginning about the amount of time it actually takes to build these parts. Well, the main reason is the number of post-processes you have to go through is very exhaustive, very laborious. So the future, well, really, there's not a great deal that that's exciting about a bed fusion. I think it's exciting enough on its own, <laughs> personally. But quad lasers, this is a big thing. But these, uh, this one here is just showing off a little bit, really, because they're not actually building one part, they're building a batch of parts. So no one's actually really got their multiple laser system to work, work in tandem, building up one solid part. They're just building a bunch of separates. So don't be fooled by this. In-process monitoring, that, that's what the big silly ear is about, because I've seen some research going on that is not only monitoring the visual quality of the weld, because that's what you're doing, you're welding layers on layers. Not only do you get visual monitoring, but also acoustic monitoring too. A good quality weld makes a certain noise, makes sense. So you can now do in-process monitoring to judge the quality of your build, or more to the point, judge if there's any errors in your build, which is much more important. An increased level of automation, that's very important too. At the moment, the machines are just modular. They just sit on their own. There's no feeding the parts in. There's no feeding the parts out. It's all done manually. Bespoke alloys. These parts, all the materials were designed for other processes. Casting, CNC machine billets. There's not really any bespoke additive manufacturing materials, which of course is contributing to all the problems you're getting. So there's a lot of work going on to develop materials at the moment, but that should come in the next 10 years, I imagine, by the time we start to qualify some of these. Okay, so now we're on to direct energy deposition, and this video is probably not going to work either, is it? Yes. So this is a powder process. You can see you've got the uh, tubes feeding the power, powder into the, into the head. <laughs> This is, of course, a time-lapse video. Don't get any misconceptions about that. I have no idea what they're building. It's maybe a fan casing for an engine. It does look fairly fan casing-like. But you can see it's, in a, it's not in a chamber. It's not in an open environment. And how you, they get around the local um, the oxidation risk is they inject inert gases, such as argon, into the stream of the molten powder. And that stops any oxidation happening at the weld. But I don't know the scale of this, but if it is a fan casing, you could expect that to be probably a metre in diameter, I'd say, for some of them if not a hell of a lot more. I'm sure you've all seen a fan casing in the jet on, a, on an airliner. So what are we up to? It's about eight hours to do that build, which is pretty good, really, because machined out of titanium, that would take you a hell of a time, wouldn't it, Steve? It really would, especially if that was a good meter, meter or so. So there you go, seven and a half hours. That's a nice little video. So, powders. It's just a laser, powder, injection, inert gas. I'm sure you can work it out. It's not particularly complicated. Very mature process. There's lots of companies out there doing this. And wires. I mentioned wire at the beginning. Wires is a funny one, because it's not really being adopted 
uh, in industry. There's not very many commercial processes. In fact, there's only a couple of companies out there looking at this extensively. Don't get too bogged down in the detail of this because plasma, even the people that use plasma don't really understand it. They just understand that it works, which is a kind of an odd situation. I've never met anyone that's been able to explain to me what plasma, what actually the mechanisms are of how it works. But all that we really need to understand is you combine electricity with the gas and it creates an extremely high um, high energy, high temperature gas, which melts metal. The applications, really, this is it, in a nutshell. That's what you deposit, which is really rough, really crude, really dirty, really unoptimized, really low resolution. But you're pretty much depositing the material that you need. You can see here what you machine away, what you end up with. And if you figure before that that would have been a, just a solid block of material, you've made a huge material saving. Now, titanium is running out. We have a very fi we have, there is a finite amount of titanium left, more so than with other materials, in that I mentioned earlier that the swarf is useless. Titanium oxide is, is almost unusable. So once you've used the material, it's very difficult to, uh, to recycle it. Whereas with aluminium, you can just recycle that indefinitely. So really, we are, we are running out of what they call virgin titanium. They can use titanium again. You can recycle it to a certain extent, but it's not. The quality of it is nowhere near as good as the virgin stuff. So yeah, it's a sad truth, but it really does emphasize the need for direct energy deposition. So they need to get this to work, otherwise aerospace is screwed, really, because titanium is extremely compatible with carbon fiber. Carbon fiber is not compatible at all with aluminium. You get a lot of corrosion when the two materials interface. I think it's galvanic corrosion. And of course, carbon fiber in aerospace is going through the roof. Over 50% of most modern airliners are the 50% of the structural weight is carbon fiber. And carbon fiber can only go with titanium. Perhaps some steels too. I think steels is okay. But of course steel and titanium. Titanium wins. Merasing steel on the other hand is a good steel. But that's only quite early on in its development. In a few years time merasing steel is a contender to be as, as high strength and low weight as titanium. Or the strength to weight ratio anyway. There are a few niche applications for direct energy deposition, adding features to workpieces. But this is kind of very similar to near net shape production anyway. Cladding, you can clad dissimilar metals, which is useful for some things, for like uh, if you need low friction in your engine block in your car, for example, you can coat a low friction material onto the inner side of the bores. Repair work, sure you've seen a lot of videos of turbine blades being repaired. But that's again quite a niche one. And reworking materials. So instead of you know chucking your failed build in the bin, you can just add a little widget on there and, and reuse it again. So there's a few applications, but really the near net shape production, that's what all the research is going into. So, this is a quick breakdown of powder versus wire because they're both fairly similar processes. I know we're running a little bit over, we did start a little bit late, so I hope you're enjoying yourself, so it doesn't matter. That's my, that's my plan anyway, because I'm enjoying myself, I love this stuff. As you can see, wire, really, it kind of wins. The only thing that's really not great is the resolution. But ultimately, if, you if you're going to machine it away afterwards, does the resolution matter? Not really. I'm sure you can inspect this a bit more thoroughly in your own time, but really the reds tell you all you need to know in the powder. It's just, there's too many issues really. Whereas wire offers a much better solution, I feel. <coughs> Limitations. 2.5 dimensional design. It may seem quite funny, 2.5 degrees, uh, di dimensions rather. But again, it's very line of sight. You can only deposit, you know, 
in one direction. You're very limited in what you can do. But you can build huge structures. So you know, there's the payoff there, and you're saving a lot of money. And a lot of prismatic machine designs are 2.5D anyway. Machining is, is pretty much that. This is a 3D design. This is a 2D design, really. Or 2.5D, rather. Like I said before, the materials were designed for welding. So at the moment, you can only get welding wires for some materials. They don't make welding wires for 7,000 series, 6,000 series aluminium, whereas that, the uses for those materials are very, very high. I mentioned oxidation of titanium is a real problem. And getting local inert gas shielding to work is a challenge. Aluminium ablation. In a vacuum, aluminium literally evaporates out of your alloy. So if you've used your pure titanium 6-4 alloy starter material in a vacuum, such as electron beam melting, and in this case, uh, EBAN, which is a wire deposition technology by Skiaki, the aluminium literally evaporates off. So the material that's left doesn't have, the, doesn't have as high an aluminium content that is required. The anisotropy of the mechanical properties. You can see here the sort of built, this is as built for a wire process. You can see the crystals, very, very small crystals here, kind of medium crystals here, and a bloody ginormous one up here. And of course the crystals dictate your mechanical properties. So you're getting different mechanical properties as you go through the build, which may or may not be a good thing. This is the rolled condition, so they roll it as they go, and you get a much more homogeneous finish. So there are things that you can do, but as built, it is a, it's something that a designer absolutely needs to consider. And I mentioned earlier about the thermal, thermally induced distortion. You can see here you get the banana effect, and that's because of the additive compressive, um, oh no, tensile rather, tensile stresses that build up. Horizon technology, like I said before, we've only got welding grades of metals at the moment. There is no wire or powder out there for 6007 series aluminium. It's never been needed before. You can vary the alloy content of your material properties. And this is especially true of powder. And one thing where powder is a big, big plus in the box, because you can have one manifold tube feeding a pure alloy, a pure element, such as aluminium. And you can have some copper and some sodium coming in from different channels, which means as you go through your build, you can modify your mechanical properties of your material as you go along. Now that could be an incredibly powerful tool in the future. Not only a designer has geometry that they can play with to get a better result from what they're trying to achieve, but also you can actually vary your mechanical properties. Very powerful tool, and I'm sure we'll see that coming in the future. Hybrid manufacturing, I think Steve's going to go into that at some point. And multi-material deposition. You can deposit different materials into different parts. You can put sensors into your structures. Think about that. You can build a, a massive spar on a plane, and the spar will tell you if it's going to fail, because you'll have a stress sensor put straight through the middle. Just a strain gauge. right?